Hey guys, welcome back to Telltale. I'm Emily. I'm Greg. And we are going to be talking about the Howling Tower, another Fritz Liber. Liber. Got to make sure I'm saying it right. I always want to say Lieber. Me too. I, it's... I should be long, right? Mm -hmm. I don't know. <laughs> I don't know. What is English? What is, wrong? What the, is the, the English German language? way is G-I is Lieb. Yep. I-E is Lieb. Yep. That's yeah. proper pronunciation. I struggle with English as a human who has it at English. That's true. Yeah. So. Well, oh, so then, well, here's the thing, though. Because, yeah, in, it could be English. either way. <laughs> in America, we just slaughter whatever language we feel like and make it Americanized English. We have and that's rules. really what I've just done here. So we have rules in English. I know. Just I don't them. follow them. Ever. Nobody, it's... even the proper language, doesn't I know. follow the rules. We're on the struggle bus <laughs> as a country. Someone, some help. Anyway. Yes. <laughs> so yes, we are going to be going through the Howling Tower, which is another. How do you say the the giant's name? Fafford. 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 Okay. Fafford. Fafford and, and the, the Gray Mouser. Yes. Because my dyslexia was just like, <laughs> yeah, it's, but I've, I've heard it said okay, by good. other people. Okay. So that's how I've heard it. Yeah, I've only ever read it. So I'm like, I'm not even going to try. I'm just like, <laughs> welcome to the land of. <laughs> yeah, that's me when I'm reading. That's fantasy. one of the hardest things about fantasy stories is fantasy authors feel that need to make up these yeah. weird names that are it's not like, how do you like say it? Dennis or or yeah. joe like a <laughs> and, traditional spelling of and something so they come up with something that you just look at and you go whatever <laughs> yeah and so for <laughs> dyslexic people like my reading things is like if i don't understand words though i can usually just like make up something in my brain as a nickname and then mm -hmm. i fill it in or like if i don't understand a word or can't read it i just look at the context surrounding it and that's I get times where i do like like you said yeah. I, I just substitute something else yeah that like, i can frank. remember <laughs> and his name is frank <laughs> yeah. to me. so there it is mm -hmm. but yeah so go ahead and give us the info drop them dates Okay, the Howling Tower is the third of the Fafford and Grey Mauser series by Fritz Leiber, mm -hmm. and Leiber's tenth story overall. Yeah. And it was published again in Unknown Magazine, the Fantasy Companion, edited by John W. Campbell Jr. to Astounding Science Fiction. And this was published in the June 1941 issue. Nice. And that's where we read it is in pdfs mm -hmm. that we found online of the actual issue of unknown for june 1941 though it is available um i've got a paperback buried somewhere sure, called sure. swords sure. against death that was published by ace books way back in the early 1980s yeah. is in mint condition so it's very valuable yeah. I wish you could see the beautiful stacks of books we have here, but because beautiful. you are facing us, hey, if you're surrounded by literature, even if it tumbles over and kills you, what a way to go. Yeah, but as far as <laughs> as far as beauty, I'm trying to recreate the set in the Capitol building from Logan's Run. <laughs> now, you've been growing the beard. Yeah. I don't have the cats, though. <laughs> um, well, you can borrow mine if you need them. But anyway, so... Are we ready for the synopsis or do you have sure, more to say? Okay. It. So I'm really enjoying these stories. It starts off, there they were, two guys in a bleak desert-like setting with their guide. And their guide is freaking out because there's this weird sound of howling in the distance. And they're like, ah, it's just wolves. And the guide's like, it's not just wolves. And they're like, nah, it's just wolves. So they go to sleep because night comes. And then they wake up and their guide is gone. Just gone. And they're like, oh, look, there's his footprints. Let's just follow him. So eventually they start following him. And they're like, how mysterious that he just, like, is gone. Like, and I didn't hear any wolves or anything come to our camp, so we couldn't have been dragged away by a wolf so quietly anyway. But that is the legend about this tower, is that people just disappear. Yeah, so they just kind of disappear and never come back. And so they're like, all right, well, let's follow these, these you know, footprints. And um, our, our very large friend... What's his name again? Foffer. Frank. <laughs> Foffer. Foffer. I will get it right. Um, Foffer starts kind of getting goofy and silly. Like, 
as they hear the howling, it's very ominous, and he's just trying to be loud and boisterous and counteract the sound or whatever. And the Grey Mauser's like, this is still kind of not like him, though. This is a little off for his personality for such a serious situation. Like, we're in the desert without a guide, have no idea where this sound is coming from. We don't even, we can't even see the wolves, and we can see for miles because it's all desert land and dunes and stuff. So, like... He just thinks it's a little odd, but that evening they go to sleep, and he wakes up in the morning, and Faber is gone. And he's like, well, shit. What? He was already acting weird. But then he sees kind of in the distance what he thinks might be his friend running towards mm. this tower, and he sees the footprints, so he goes and starts pursuing it. And again, the howling starts. And he's like, this was just so weird. But the closer it gets to the tower, the less it's the less the howling happens. Yeah. And so he finally gets to the tower and he's about to walk in and a rock falls right where he was about to, you know, right where he was moments before in the entrance of this tower. And so he's exploring the tower and he's like, it's just a freaking tower. Like, I'm not finding anything. But he finally comes into a room that looks like kind of a apothecary situation or like a chemistry lab sort of thing and finds his friends laying on the ground with these bandages all over him, but no stains of blood or signs of wounds. And then as he's, you know, trying to wake his friend and can't successfully, some old guy just wanders in. And is just freaking out because he's like, I saw you die. I saw me. I saw it. You're dead. Like, you can't be here. And then finally, like, after some altercations and talking, he gets out of this wizard guy that his family was cursed and they lived in this tower. And he just kind of let everything die, including the hounds that he locked in the basement. But he's convinced that their ghosts are still roaming around. And so he brings people to satiate the ghosts of these wolves by bringing the people closer and closer to death where they're practically ghost-like mm -hmm. and can encounter the beasts and then the beasts eat, beasts eat their ghost and the people die. Mm -hmm. um, and it keeps them quiet for a while, but it's, it's over time, it's becoming less and less successful of a plan. Mm -hmm. So the mouser gets it in his head like to get the guy to drink the poison he keeps offering his victims he's like you can save your friend here's some poison it'll bring you within an inch of your life but you still have a chance to save him and if you can save him before midnight and survive before midnight y'all will come back and it'll be fine and so the mouser's like nah i'm not gonna believe you unless you do it too and so he gets in an altercation and forces him to drink the stuff and sure enough the uh, wolves are starting to eat his dear friend and so he was gonna rush up and try and like kill him with his ghosty sword but then he realized the wolves just want the other guy who locked them in the, the basement and never returned for them so he lets them eat him and they all wake up and live happily ever after the end uh -huh. um and so their travels and adventures can continue but it mm -hmm. kind of stops there they're still in the tower Mm -hmm. So, abrupt end. Yeah, but I mean, they got themselves to safety. They can just walk away. Yes. And I'm adding humor where there is no humor. This is a yeah. pretty serious it's, it's adventure a story. It's a seriously presented story. Yeah, it, it, but... There's a lot of mystery and mm -hmm. um, almost a horror story. It kind of is. It's, it's a ghost story. It's mm -hmm. a haunted building, haunted house story. Mm -hmm. um, and it's... I mean, it's just a really, again, it's a really well done, fun adventure. Like, my narrative does not give it justice. The no. crafting of the sentences yeah, and the building these. of the world and the way the characters are described are so well done that it, it, you're, you're so drawn into this tale. Yeah. And these characters, of course, are repeat characters. We've encountered them before. They're mm -hmm. part of a series of stories. Mm -hmm. So it's just kind of fun to see what happens next. Yeah. But yeah, great fantasy story. Um, in previous videos, we talked about this being kind of a... D and, the basis for a lot of D&D world building. Gaijax admitted that, that mm -hmm. this was 
you know, there were a lot of in, a lot of different fantasy stories that influenced him in developing D and D, but this was the primary series that he drew upon in formatting that whole Which uh, is game. So interesting because most people say it was actually Tolkien, and that was added later. Mm -hmm. But yeah. no, it's interesting to hear this because this is the first time I have. Well, previous video we did was the mm -hmm. first time ever hearing that. Mm -hmm. And it's it's so unfortunate that it's so underknown by people who love the game of D and D like myself. Yeah. So really interesting history. And it it's you know the history of fantasy literature during this time period, like I say, before this you had fairy tales, you had things like William Morris or the the Worm of Rubros, and you had Conan in the pages of Weird Tale, Conan mm -hmm. and. Um, the fantasies of Clark Ashton Smith, mm -hmm. but otherwise you really had nothing to go on. You had the Iliad and the Odyssey and Beowulf. Yeah, and, mythos um, stuff. You know, the King Arthur myth myths from um, the Mort to Arthur and Pilgrim's Progress, stuff like that was what constituted what we call fantasy back before Fritz Leiber started writing these things. So what we're seeing here is something that's very different from anything that's been done before, much, much closer to what we have today in fantasy of, of the, you know, adventures going on a quest and the nomadic you know, having life all life. these, these advent different adventures and mm -hmm. running into magic and weird creatures. It, you know, it comes somewhat from Conan, but it also comes a lot from Fritz Leiber. And so this was instrumental and, and Unknown Magazine also published a lot of other fantasy stories that had the effect of, of bringing us to where we are today with fantasy. Yeah. Uh, like El Sprague de Camp wrote a lot of what you would call urban fantasies. Mm -hmm. And, you know, back then it wasn't called urban fantasy, but it is essentially urban fantasy. Mm -hmm. It was these mythical creatures appearing in the lives of people in 1940 mm -hmm. and causing havoc usually done in a comedic way mm -hmm. which was really cool yeah. because they they also pioneered that kind of thing like that would lead to things like disc world and and princess bride mm -hmm. and things like that mm -hmm. so you know the the stories that were published in unknown and in particular these stories of fritz Leiber had a huge huge influence on everything that came after mainly because there was hardly anything else mm -hmm. to um to talk about in fantasy literature at the time in, in 1941. yeah for sure and i there are just some things i really appreciate about the story it the same thing for the other the previous story I love the healthy friendship, mm -hmm. the healthy male, male friendship that these two main characters have. Yeah. They have such deep brotherly camaraderie that you don't see in a lot of stories. I think more modern stories, there's always like a girl that's getting in the way and some yeah. toxicity and all this other stuff. The conflict is not inner for them. It is not in their relationship. It is in the world around them that they are willing to face together. Mm -hmm. And I just love seeing that healthy masculinity in a fantasy story. Um, I wish we could see more of it in more modern stuff. Yeah. Um, so that's something that I feel like a lot of modern fantasy is missing is that the there's struggles in relationships that cause these dynamics. You don't see a lot of these, like the characters know who they are. They don't know what they're up against though. Mm -hmm. And I think that's a really interesting way of writing, and I would love to see more of that. Though what you point out is also one of the criticisms of everything that was being written in the magazines back in the 1940s is yeah. that there weren't any women. <laughs> yeah, I, I see that as you an know? issue, but I think... But sometimes it's not an issue. Sometimes yeah. two guys do get together to play football on Saturday yeah. afternoon, and sometimes there aren't any women. Just meet in a bar and decide they're going to go on adventures because they like each other. Yeah, and yeah. They're secure in who they are and what they do. Sometimes two guys travel cross country to pick up a used car in some other state and bring it back. Yeah. It's a an adventure, you know, much less of an adventure. Right. Sometimes two guys get together and they run into some kind of evil spirit that's trying to kill everybody. Yeah, you never <laughs> and know. It happens. It does. It's real life. <laughs> that that's all out there. 
Sometimes they go ghost hunting and lose, you know. It's yeah, crazy. And we, you know, there's nothing wrong with having mm-hmm. fiction that shows that. Side yes, like and I think side. that's underappreciated in our mm-hmm. society. We need so, to see more, I think, male characters have softness towards each other and have healthy camaraderie and have really good friendships and know themselves well. But I think more importantly, what's happening here is these two characters complement each other. They yes. have different skill sets. Yes. That and they're not insecure come into about play. It. And they're not insecure about it. Yeah. They don't mind that the other yeah. knows something we're, different. Where one, mm-hmm. you know, I mean, Fafford is the strong man of, yeah, of he's, the team. Yeah, he's the berserker, so yeah, to speak. He's, he's the knight. He's got all the strength. He's got the big broadsword. Mm-hmm. You know, the gray mouser is more of a thief. Yeah, he's yeah. more stealth. I think he, if I remember right, he has a certain amount of magic. Mm-hmm. And so he's more the more the intellectual type mm-hmm. and the two of them to get a brain situation yeah the, mm-hmm. the two of them together are what is needed to get through these weird situations yes. that they stumble into mm-hmm. but i find it very wholesome just like very much like sir hereward and mr yes Fitz. yes you know you had the one is a puppet brought to life and is magical mm-hmm. and the other one is a knight it's the exact same yeah pairing. it's a very yep it's a very similar pairing um but I just love it. And I love that it's it's clean. Mm-hmm. Just set by some violence. So, you know, PG, PG-13 style. I could hand this to a 10-year-old and not really worry yeah. about them reading this because it's not super racy or anything like that. It's not inappropriate for younger ages kind of thing. This is no different than the kind of stuff they see in their own you know, Disney movies where mm-hmm. knights are fighting dragons and stuff. Mm-hmm. So, but it's better than Disney. It's way better than Disney. <laughs> um, but yeah, it's just a really lovely pairing of characters. I love the world building. Like, yeah, it's a desert. How interesting can it be? But it's the ominous tower amidst this nothingness mm-hmm. that really makes it interesting. And the history of the tower, like, mm-hmm. it's. Again, it's one of these stories that gives you just enough that you want more, mm-hmm. but not so much that it's the, everything. It doesn't right. just hand everything to you on a platter. It leaves a lot to the imagination. Right. Um, you don't need more mm-hmm. is the best part of it. Mm-hmm. So it's just really great writing and a fun adventure. Just it two is. bros going through the desert. Yeah. Um, like I can't, and again, like when we talk, when we're talking about this, we really don't do it justice. So you really no. have to read it to no. understand what makes it good. Because mm-hmm. <clears throat> just describing it to you in our own layman's terms in a few minutes of a video is not going to give you the essence of what we have experienced through this literature. But that's what we're here for. We're not here to to give them this story. Yeah, we don't want to give you the whole thing. To- yeah give you a taste and, and yeah. give you a recommendation hey this is one of the great ones check this out absolutely or this one is horribly hp lovecraft racist yeah Clearly. yeah you know? i mean like hp <laughs> lovecraft has some great writing some of it is not great though yeah some not all but yeah mm-hmm. so yeah this is another top tale isn't it excellent. yes it is excellent i It'll be interesting to see if all of them can. I, mean, I know. Eventually, it's. I gotta think if they gotta start getting. You no, know, we. Ha- if we're kind of running into that too with like Philip K. Dick, like, do we have ones that didn't make it in Top Tales? I think we have one. No, we've had quite a few. That okay, were good. Top Tales, but there have been quite a few that were. Yeah, top a majority, tales. I think, were Top Tales. Yeah. So Which, we'll see if this is a. I mean, he's just that yeah. great of a writer. Mm-hmm. But this is the same two characters kind of doing the same kind of thing over and over and over. Mm-hmm. I'm thinking eventually it's going to start to be, oh, here we go again, mm-hmm. you know, and not Maybe. be quite so good. Maybe not. I yeah. mean, um, what's the one? In, in One of the stories that was written, I think, in 1969, won either the Hugo or the Nebula Award. Mm-hmm. It was that it was considered that good. And he had already written a lot of stories ahead of that. So, wow. You know, maybe we'll he is able to keep that Moment. high level of of quality to all of these stories. Mm-hmm. Come back and see. Yeah. So, <laughs> yeah, I have nothing else to say. So me either. And leave your comments. If have you read the Howling Tower? Tell us what you think. Tell us anything else you you want to say about Fritz Lieber that maybe we don't know and haven't covered. Um, we'd love to hear it. And come on back. What is the next Fritz Leiber 
liver liver lover. The next one is they never come back. <gasps> but it's not a Falford and Gray Mouser oh, story. Okay. It's a science. Because they better come back. Well, yeah. this this next one in, in Liber's bibliography it was published in Future Fiction. It's a science fiction story, a okay. novella titled "Made Never Come Back." That's the Ooh. next one to talk about by Fritz Liber. So yeah, join us. So we again. take a break from the Faffer and Gray Mouser. Dang it! I like them. <laughs> we'll get into them. More. They're my besties now. Okay. All right. Well, thanks for joining us, guys. We will see you next time. Bye. Bye.